Welcome to the Chuck Shoot Podcast. Wow, I'm excited today. This was a really fun interview with Troy Patrick Farrell. Um, sometimes you just you interview somebody and you guys just click and it just happens and it feels so natural. And that's how this interview was. There was not a lot of uh, dead pauses or stumbling or nervousness on my end. Um, he just made me feel really natural and at ease. And, um, you know, it's just he's just a good storyteller. So he just made my job really easy. Um, I had some, you know, decent questions, but he just took the reins and had some great stories. Um, if you are a fan of the 80s bands, the 80s metal bands, you're going to love this. This is quite a treat. Um, and if you're not a fan of the 80s metal bands, you might become one after listening to this interview because I feel like the stories are so good. And um, some, of, and he talks not only about the bands he's been in, like White Lion and Pretty Boy Floyd and some of these um, lesser known lesser known bands, but some of the the bigger stars of those days, like Guns N' Roses, his interactions with them and Sebastian Bach from Skid Row and Tommy Lee from Motley Crue. And so um, I think in, in his opinions on um, some of the bigger names of the of the era. So I think you guys will enjoy this one. I really enjoyed it. It's probably one of my favorite episodes to date. And um, I think there'll be a lot of stories to that will get passed around, maybe some some articles on sleaze rocks, I'm, I'm guessing, is uh, was going to happen from this interview. So enjoy this one with Troy Patrick Farrell. Okay, here we are at CB Live in Phoenix, Arizona with Troy Patrick Farrell. Farrell or Farrell? How, do you, how would you say Farrell, it? yeah. Farrell. Okay, is that Irish name? It is Irish. Back in the day before I was uh, a sparkle in my mother's eye, uh, way, way back, it was O Farrell. And throughout generations, oh, really? the O got dropped. But yeah. Full on uh, Irish. That's awesome. Yeah, my grandpa's 100 percent Irish. So a little connection there, and yeah. then we also have a mutual connection. Brandon Gibbs. I interviewed him, and yeah, we're Brandon playing Gibbs. with him tonight. Yeah, and then cheap thrill. Did you you played with Donnie V? I, I interviewed him as well. Donnie V back in okay. So I grew up in Chicago. Huge enough's enough fan. Yeah, and um, I was sort of you know where my brother's uh, generation was Cheap Trick. My generation mm -hmm. was Enough's Enough. And, uh, you know, we were just outside of south side of Chicago, Blue Island, which is where they're from, in, yeah. in, in uh, northwest Indiana. And so I grew up playing the Thirsty Whale and going to see, you know, Donnie V, Enough's Enough, all those bands back in the day. And just through connections, I said, uh, this is back in, God, I want to say early 2000s, maybe even 90, late 90s. I said, hey, bro, you, you need to get out of that apartment and, and let's go do some shows. And mm -hmm. so we did, we did some live shows back in uh, the Midwest many, you know, 20 years ago. You okay. Know? So, yeah, yeah. So I played with Donnie V. I tracked on his album Just Enough. Oh. I tracked about three tunes on there. And then uh, I played in Enough's Enough with Chip and Johnny Monaco as oh, well okay. as recently as 2016. Have you heard the new Donnie V album? I have, yeah, Beautiful it's, Things. It's, it's a, a isn't great that amazing? Album. Yeah, he's, I think uh, it's genius. he's just meant to do that. Yeah, you know? definitely. And yeah. I think it's helped that he's cleaned up, you know, so that he's could just focus strictly on that and not be distracted. Yeah, I'll yeah. drink to that. <laughs> I'll drink to that too. <laughs> so, but you were technically raised in uh, Griffith, Indiana, right? Griffith, Indiana. So yep. did you ever I'm go? I'm a clod hopper. Yeah, did you ever... <laughs> Like the, the line from the Christmas story. Exactly. Did you ever play on the old Sherman tanks in the park there? My buddy lives there, actually. He yeah. lives in Griffith. And he said there's like these old Sherman tanks that you can play on. Yeah. So my very first gig was at the at, at uh, Central Park, which was mm -hmm. downtown Griffith. And there's a huge tank there. That was my first gig. It was a battle of the bands. And, uh, wow. And I used to climb on that tank. Do you ever go to uh, Billy O's, Bill, what is it? Billy O Dynamite Music Shop? I have been there. I have been there. It's right downtown, yeah. um, right across from the police station, which I, you know, been in or out twice, you know, <laughs> give or take. Okay. And, uh, but yeah, it's uh, downtown Griffith's a cool, very quaint, you know, 20,000 yeah. people. My mom still lives in the same house that I was uh, born and bred in. So it's, How uh, long has that shop been there? Because he's the basis for Survivor, or he was. Or yes, was. yes. Uh, you know, I want to say maybe a half a dozen years to 10 okay. years. Yeah, I think for a little bit. Okay, cool. Yeah, but I've been in there. He's got a lot of cool, yeah. weird boutique stuff yeah. and, and trippy, you know, cool. It's one of those places you go in and you find a, a you know diamond in the rough. Nice. So you started playing the drums at age 12. It was after a Dio concert. And then your brother played bass and the other brother played guitar. So did you guys start a band together? Never started a band together. And it took hmm. a long time for me to actually uh, jam with my brother, Sean, who uh, still plays bass to this day. My brother, Scott, was playing in the guitar in the school band. So, hmm. you know, they'd have a performance or a play or whatever, and he would be playing guitar okay. in the band. But uh, he was meant to be a chef, and that's the route oh. he took. And uh, my brother, Sean, still plays bass and, and gigs out, you know, wow. still has the do. You know, he and nice. I kind of look like, you know, look like women. So it's cool. <laughs> 
Do you play any other instruments besides the drums? I, I haven't. You know, I I, I don't. No. I don't. Did I you sing even a do little bit. You, yeah, you do backing vocals. Yeah, okay. yeah. You know, for better or for worse, I do sing a little bit. Okay, so yeah, you're a big Enough's and Us fan. Uh, Cheap Trick was a big influence. You're a big Motley Crue and Tommy Lee fan. So what do you think of the resurgence of uh, popularity of Motley Crue now with that movie The Dirt, now the new tour? Well, I, I got to tell you, um, I wasn't a big fan of the movie. Really? really? Yeah, I, it just, huh. it didn't really like blow my mind, you know. Um, but, you know, I toured with, with Crue in a band called The Raskins and Alice Cooper in 2014, the okay. start of the final tour. It was a two-year tour, 2014 and 2015. I did 60 dates with the Raskins opening up for Motley Crue and Alice Cooper. Wow. And that was awesome, playing arenas and stadiums every yeah. night, um, huge outdoor places, Jones Beach, uh, the Hollywood Bowl, mm. uh, Madison Square Garden, you know, uh, Joe Louis Arena in Detroit. So we played some great, you know, it's a great experience. And um, I, I think they, they ended as they should. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I know that they signed the contract and they, you know, whatever, but listen, if you're meant to play rock and roll and go out and do it, yeah. if nobody cared and nobody were going to buy tickets, then it wouldn't matter. But people are buying tickets and they want to go see them. So why not, you know, let them go out there and play. Yeah, no. And I hear, uh, they're all in working with train. Even Vince is working with a trainer and yeah. he's Nikki six says he's kicking ass. Yeah, so I'm no. like, kind of excited. I think, I think if anything, it's a good motivation for him to be healthier. Cause it looked, yes. you know, it looked like he was on an unhealthy path and, sure. and, and even, uh, you know, it didn't even look like he was overweight, but it looked like he probably was ill from the inside, you know, like something's mm. going on, you know, and, and, you know, when you're drinking and you're out there not sleeping and not taking care of yourself yeah. and you get older right. and you've been doing yeah, it for 30 yeah. years, it catches up to you. So yeah. if anything, th this could be a new lease on life for, for those guys, yes. you know, getting their shit together and, and, uh, going out there and rocking again. I yeah. think they have a lot to prove. They can't go out there and stink. They're no, going to no, have no, to be no. good. So they'll, they'll kick ass. I'm yeah. sure. So, um, the other, this big news just happened yesterday. Uh, Neil Pert died. Yeah. Were you, uh, was he an influence on you as a you drummer? Know, I mean, he's he, one of the most famous drummer, most amazing drummers. Yeah. You know, um, for gro Rush. growing up in the, in the school and the, and the, and the drummers that spoke to me, guys like Tommy Lee, Bunny mm -hmm. Carlos, Vic Fox from Enough's Enough. Mm -hmm. Um, Neil Peart was not necessarily an influence because he's he's doing like algebra you know what i mean <laughs> and i'm more like one plus one equals oh, three okay, you know yeah. so it's progressive rock it's very complex yeah, yeah. but i mean awesome it, i mean fantastic drummer i mean I, legendary yeah. you know um but it that stuff doesn't i just sit there and shake my head going wow this dude was on another planet mm -hmm. you know but yeah very shocking to hear that he had uh it was it brain cancer i think so yeah you know, and yeah. it had three years but you three know years he, he was the type that yeah. uh he's, kept you it know, quiet He's like a dog, you know, dogs don't show their pain. And, mm. and, uh, you know, he, um, you know, to keep, to play at that level for as long as he did, you know, he's not back there just doing, you know, ACDC. I mean, he's killing it. Right. And yeah. to do that for all those years and be that old and go out there and tour under that, uh, circumstance was pretty, pretty amazing. And it's, uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're losing heavyweights. It, I mean, it's getting, it's <sighs> yeah. really shows your mortality. It's like, you know, who's next, you yeah. know, and we know that it just proves that any day could be our last day. Right. You know? No, Kinda that's what my grandpa said was the worst thing about getting old was all your friends die. Yeah. Yeah. The older you get. I mean, he lived in his nineties. So, um, so anyways, back to you, you moved to LA in 1992. Yeah. Did you have a plan or was there a band that you had joined or did you just say, fuck it, I'm moving to LA. No, I did have a plan. Okay. Um, so a, a buddy of mine from high school, we went back to central park. My first gig, my first gig was in a band called lady Scarlet and this singer, my, my buddy, Rick, was living in LA and he'd been out there for a couple of years. He went out there going, Hey, I'm going to just go out here and try and make it as a singer, which mm -hmm. never happened. And also my old manager from a band called brat that I had in my, my teens was also living out there. And so the bass player and I said, you know, I graduated high school the following spring as we drove out to LA and my buddy Rick had been out there networking and was going to get me in a band with uh, Christina LeRae. Now Christina dates the bass player from the band called South gang. Oh, I remember South okay. Gang. Yeah. And they had the Floyd's Funk Revival. Yeah. Um, okay. And then what's Butch, the Butch Walker? Butch yeah, Walker. Yeah. 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 So she had a solo band and he, I was going to be like, dude, you're in. You're in. Well, I ne I went out to LA. I still haven't met her yet. It's, <laughs> it's been 25 years. So I've had a lot of those conversations. Yeah, sure. I'll do your podcast. Never hear from again. Never yeah. hear. Yeah. Yep. yeah. The number so. you've called has been disconnected. <laughs> but so um, I don't know if you remember... Uh, your buddy uh, Diggity, Diggity Dave Aragon. He yeah, played we're going to see him tonight. Yeah, he's going to be here tonight. He played in a band called Shake the Shake Faith, the Faith with Tommy Thayer, who's currently the 
guitarist for a band called Kiss. He's currently Ace Frehley yeah. and Kiss. Yeah, he's currently Ace Frehley. Now, he said, he told me that your band opened up for him one time, and he was kind of blown away, And but he couldn't remember the name of the band. Do you remember that band? Uh, this was back in the early days. Man, I want to say either a band called Dragon uh, with some Chicago guys. However, I don't think Dragon, which is a little bit more of a bluesier rock band, mm-hmm. would have opened up for Shake the Faith. Yeah. And I don't recall opening up for Shake the Faith. But I recall seeing them at FM Station in oh. North Hollywood all the time. But uh, I, I've known uh, I've known Dave Aragon yeah. for you know twenty you know, since I moved to LA. Essentially, yeah. so he's he was a great in that band. Then he was on uh, Pimp My Ride or whatever. Yeah. Uh, he told me also to ask you about about the FM Station and Filthy McNasty yeah. and who also in the Viper Room. Tell me about those days back Filthy in those. Mc- so I used to go to um, FM Station in North Hollywood. It was at the corner of Lancashire and Victory. Okay, okay. and one street to the east, the next intersection is Beck. I could stumble home from FM Station. I oh. lived in North Hollywood with my former manager and bass player, and I could walk over to FM Station. Was that expensive, by the way, or is it way more expensive now, or is it? I think you know it, it's it's all relative. I okay. think you know it was expensive back then, and then you know <laughs> the more money you make, the more expensive it is. It just sure, seems sure. to kind of go. You can never. Okay. It's like Getting being on a ahead. treadmill, yeah. you know. Gotcha. But uh, yeah, I used to go there and uh, I befriended one of the bartenders there and he would always make me all these weird. So I was because I wasn't a drinker. Mm -hmm. I didn't like beer. And I didn't like hard alcohol. I didn't like the way to, I'm drinking a beer right yeah, now. Yeah, and I was going to say, like, something's changed. <laughs> some, something's changed. <laughs> the Irish roots finally Yeah, yeah, you know, they finally, you know, they, they had to, uh, you know, like a, like a good beer, you know, has to kind of, mm-hmm. you know, sit in a nice, where, right. whatever you do with beer. Anyway, uh, so I would drink like Nutty Monkeys and, you know, goofy stuff that tasted What's like pina nut- colada. Wait, it, time out. What's a Nutty, nutty monkey? monkey? would be just one of these little concoctions of, it was like a pina colada kind of flavor, you know, with okay. a bunch of different like rums, you know? So, huh. and then I always got a bonus. He liked me. He's like, uh, Hey man, I got the bonus monkey for you. So I would drink the one and then he had it sitting on the side. Oh. It was a whole nother one. So I got two for one, you know? Okay. And you get just annihilated because it tastes like you're just, you know, like, drinking a banana split you know mm. but it's got rum and all sorts of stuff in it so it sounds dangerous I would, ha- I would have to make those uh, long walks home uh, right down the street but yeah I mean, fm station was a great place it was awesome that it was right down the road from there you see bands like shake the faith uh uh god i'm trying to think of all the other bands uh jones street which had brent woods in oh it, brent in the woods band. he's yeah. from uh wild Sh- uh, wild side wild side and uh, sean crosby yeah you know what i mean so yeah. um you know, there's a lot of cats that would, would play. I mean, that was the only club to go to in the Valley, you know? Yeah. So it was it was cool being up there. That's very cool. So, and then um, a couple of highlights that you had mentioned before of your career, because you've played with so many bands, and we'll get to that in a second, and hopefully we have time. But yep. you got to meet Dio and Ace Freely. Those were some of the highlights. And then one time, I read the story where you uh, attended an after party at the Hard Rock due to your connection yeah. with Dizzy Reed. Dizzy Reed, yeah. And Axel was there with Steven Adler. Yes. Now, obviously, this isn't back in the... Crazy, crazy days, but it's still Axl Rose and Steven Adler, and you're at the party, and it was at the yeah. Hard Rock, like in a suite, like yeah. a hangover suite. I'm at picturing, the very, yeah, at the with very a bowling top, alley. With a, with a, yeah, one bowling lane and a bunch of girls not wearing a bunch of uh, clothes. I mean, they were they weren't nude, but they were scantily clad, you know, okay. as rock and roll would have it, <laughs> and they were terrible bowlers. <laughs> but yeah, you know, Steven Adler, and and I and I'm just looking around and sitting at the bar, the, the mm-hmm. fully stocked bar. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, anything you can think of there. And Steven Adler and Axel Rose. And, and I think this is the first time Steven had really Had seen Axel connected. since that whole lawsuit yes. and all the, you know, because they had their issues when he yeah. got kicked out of the band. And, and wow. this is the first time they had really connected on a friendly level. I yeah. think and it had Steven been was not sober at this point. He sobered up a couple of years ago. This was like yeah. 2006 or seven or something, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so was this is one thing I've always been wondered about. Was Axel drinking? Because I know the rest of the band, Duff and Steven and and uh, Slash, they've all gotten sober. And yeah. Izzy, too. But Axel, like, you just, you never hear that he's totally sober, but you don't hear that he's going crazy either. Is he kind of just, man? does he drink a beer now and then? Or You know, I, he's so private. You know, to, uh, I'm thinking, of, you know, I think, so, going to another Axel story, mm. there's a king in India. He's actually like a prince, uh, the king, we call him, uh, he had gone down to, uh, I'm getting all over the place here, but no, Sebastian no, Bach fine. had a birthday party at the Rainbow three nights in a row. And I'm, I'm a huge Sebastian Bach. He's probably, him and Axel are my two favorite singers of all time. So imagine this. So the Kings come into town and Sebastian comes for his birthday. And I'm trying to think of, oh, so Sebastian's there. 
And he's like, I'm texting Axel. He's coming down. He's coming down. Night number one, Axel doesn't show. Night mm-hmm. number two, Ax- literally three days at the rainbow on the same table, we celebrated Sebastian's birthday. And I don't know. Not, I'm not friends with him. I just was connected with the king. And so we were all there together. He was out in the States visiting from India. And what then, do you mean the king? Like, he's he, So his family, he's, uh, he's a, a king in India. Oh, India. Okay. Yes. A full on king. And he's wow. also a diehard Sebastian Bach fan and a huge Guns N' Roses fan. Wow. He ended up booking shows for them. White Lion played 2008. Our last shows were in India in soccer stadiums, and the King was the one that that booked it. He's just a huge rock fan. His That's fa- awesome. His it's family kinda bloodline. Like, uh, it's kind of like the guy from North Korea being a big uh, Chicago Bulls. <laughs> exactly. It's totally random, right? And <laughs> right? they got Dennis yeah. Rodman out there, you know, making world peace. Mm-hmm. But um, anyway, short story long is finally night three. Sure as shit. Axel Rose comes walking into the back table. So now we're sitting there. It's the king, Sebastian Bach, his girlfriend at the time, and Axel Rose and his And assistant. you're there too. And I'm there too. And we went down to the, I think it's called the, like the Mondrian. Axel lives in LA, has a hotel booked down the street. So we go there afterward. I was there until about six o'clock in the morning, just sitting at this round table, listening to the king talk to Axel about the king ended up booking couple years after that booking guns and roses in india and he had something to do with that and it was because of that meeting and anyway i wow. believe axel did have a couple drinks there but he was always um very polite very hospitable and very on point the guy's together he knows what he's doing yeah that's awesome yeah. wow that's a cool story <laughs> great crazy story yeah so did you actually get to like shake hands and meet axel yeah or, oh really i got to hang out with him oh. and uh he was very nice even at the GNR party that he had up in the hotel, oh, okay. considering there was 100 people there. I mean, it was jam-packed. Sure, and it, sure. was, it was just the who's who. I, I was like, this is out of a movie. So you just sit there and observe. You look to your right, you've got you know good-looking girls, terrible yeah, yeah, bowling. Yeah. You look to your left, you've got <laughs> Steven Adler and Axel talking at the bar for the first time, you know, and... I'm just going, wow, wow, this is a, this is very trippy, that but is very, very cool. Yeah. So is that like the most starstruck you've ever been or was there, you know, it wasn't even about being starstruck. It was just kind of going, man, there's some history happening here. Something's happening out right. of this, you no, know? Definitely. And, um, you know, so it's, it's not about being nervous, you know, cause they're just such nice people and just, you know, very, Hey man, how you doing? Nice to meet you. Oh, you know, you play with Dizzy, cool. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, whatever, he's on to the next person. But I was like, wow, that, yeah. that's really cool. Like, it was really mellow. Oh, I know. Because you know? he could be a total dick if he wanted. Like, sure. And that's what I always thought, you know, growing up. I thought, oh, probably these rock stars are probably real pompous. And yeah. every person, you know, from Brandon Gibbs to you, everyone I've met has been so Speaking nice. Speaking of pompous guys, Brandon Gibbs. <laughs> <laughs> he's so down to earth, dude. No, I know. It's, totally it's crazy. It's awesome. But so, um, talking about Steven Adler, I feel like his sound is like, distinctly different from the other GNR drummer, Matt Sorum. Now 100%. you played with a lot of different bands. Do you try to adjust your style depending on the band you're playing with? Like do you tune up or down or do you use more cowbell? Like I don't, I'm not really technical with drums, but you know, yes and no. Uh, you know, I, I think the approach is to, you know, definitely take from what, you know, there are songs that just have signature fills or signature, mm-hmm. like you can't leave that out. That fill is the fill. You don't right. change it. And then the other approach is to, you know, do your thing because, you know, you you can do your thing with more conviction Mm -hmm. than trying to do somebody. Like, for example, if I had to do a Rush song, I would have to approach it the way that I approach it because I can't play like him. You know what I mean? So I'd have to kind of own it with my style. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, so, yeah, it wasn't like how Neil does it, but he did it his own way and it was cool. You know, you have to really sell it. So, you know, there's there's that kind of mix of making sure you hit all the key parts, yeah. but you do it your way, okay. you know, and, and naturally your your style's just going to come out, yeah. you know? I mean, there are other guys that are great at just mimicking and emulating mm-hmm. other people, and uh, I'm not one of those, you know? <laughs> I, so I'm when you talk me. about, like, Neil being able to be so much more complex, like, yeah. what... Because I tried to play the drum... I played, like, a snare drum in middle school marching band yeah. or whatever, but I, I to try to play, like... The multiple drums and then the, the you know, there's and the foot pedals. And yeah. It's very, is that what you're talking about? Like, it's just very complicated well, there's, and there's a lot of that, things going There's that, but on. also, you know, with, with a band like Rush, very, you know, very progressive, there's time signatures, you know. Mm. I'm good at counting to four. You okay. know, they're they're doing like, you know, six, eight time and, you know, uh, five, three time and whatever, wow. whatever they're doing. And so the counts are really weird and I'm terrible hmm. at math. So... Uh, just not my style, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? And also you gotta, you have to have the finesse in the hands for yeah. something like that, where okay. I'm a little bit better, you know, kind of doing ACDC, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it's funny. Cause I just, 
I don't know a lot of the technical things. I just know when I see a good drummer, I go, wow, that guy just blew me away. Sure, sure. And uh, yeah, have you ever seen, uh, what's that guy's name, Zoltan Chaney? Yeah, so I saw him on the Motley Cruise, which was the very first cruise. Now there's 8,000 cruises, but this is back in 2008. <laughs> okay. It was uh, Vince Neil. Yeah. And it was uh, Rat and I maybe Slaughter, a bunch of, I know Zoltan plays with Slaughter yeah. now, but... And he plays Vince Neil's solo band. That's when I first saw him. Yeah, and so uh, John Karabi was on the boat with Rat and Vin opening up for Vince Neil mm -hmm. solo, right? Yeah. That's the first time I saw Zoltan. Super nice guy. I feel like he can play drums and make pizzas and, you know, do artwork all at the same time. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a little intense. Like, yeah. I can't, you know, um, I, I just remember the one time he hits this, uh, he, he hits the crash. He gets up from the drums. He runs around the drums and comes back and mm -hmm. continues playing. And I, that's a little too much for me. <laughs> It's, a, it's exhausting to watch yeah. that guy no, play, he, but like, he's great. he jumps up into oh, yeah. the... It's crazy, yeah. Uh, yeah, he's... Visually, he's got to be the number one, I oh, think, yeah. most. He's, I mean, he's maybe a, not technical. I don't know, because I'm not, but no, I just he's, he's fun a great, to watch. fantastic drummer. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like when he, you know, kind of splits the flash and the drumming, you know, uh, technicality mm -hmm. kind of a little bit more down the middle. But, I mean, he, he puts on a great show. He's super entertaining. But here's a story about that cruise. We um, are looking for a place to hang out. We go into this bar nobody's in it there's this cool filipino band just jamming and it's myself john karabi delana and uh Dar we had dario um dario lorena from he was there he played in he, he's in black label society now oh okay i like that band yeah zach wild yeah yeah I, I believe he was there anyway we get up on stage and we just start jamming we take over the stage well vince neal walks by and hears that there's rock and roll happening. Vince Neil comes in. I played Led Zeppelin. We did uh, uh, rock and roll. Is that hard to emulate John Bonham's drumming on Led Zeppelin? He, oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely up my alley. But, yeah, mm -hmm. he's he took that groove <laughs> and that pocket to another level. Like, he's he's another level, but on that, on a, you know, so you got Neil on one end, you mm -hmm. got Bonham on the other end, yeah. but at the top of his game. So we're doing rock and roll. Vince Neil singing. John Karabi's playing bass. Oh, th that was the one. I there's, saw. I saw pictures video, of this. There's, there's video of that on YouTube. Yeah. yeah. So I played with Vince Neil and John Karabi, two singers of Motley Crue at the same time, <laughs> playing Zeppelin on a cruise ship in 2008. Jesus, dude! You had a, <laughs> it was pretty fun, man. Is, yeah. So I was going to ask you though about John Karabi because I know you played with him. Um, I met him. Super nice guy. Great yeah. musician. John's great. Um, what do you think about how some people say that his lone album with Motley Crue was actually the be their best album. Yeah. And one of those people, by the way, is Mick Mars, the Motley yeah, Crue guitarist. Sure. Well, I mean, I, I agree. Um, you know, obviously... You agree that's their best album? Well, you know, here's the thing. Motley Crue, to me, are those four guys that are reuniting right now. Mm -hmm. But that album, with that being said, and listen, it was called Motley Crue, I, I, think, I think it stands in a place on its own. It really does. Mm -hmm. I feel that the musicianship on that album far exceeds any other Motley Crue album. Mm -hmm. And John, you know, took it to another level, obviously vocally, has a very different style, and musically. You can hear the difference in those albums. So, yeah. you know, Motley Crue is a brand, and they have their sound, and that, to me, is Motley Crue. That album is different. Mm -hmm. And, may, you know, I don't think they could have gotten away with calling it something else, but, you know, it didn't even really do that great as Motley Crue. Right. So, but I get the, the business end of it. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't change the name and come out as a new band, especially in those yeah. days. And you that would was have fallen already, flat on your yeah. face. So even with that brand behind them, that history, they still had a tough time with that. Album. But uh, that album, you know, obviously, is, you know, as the years go by, is becoming known as the, man, that is a great album. And it stands alone on, on a, and isn't that the only self-titled yeah. Motley Crue album? Yeah. I, you know, usually the big albums for a band is the one that's, you know... Right, Metallica, Metallica, Led exactly. Zeppelin, Led Zeppelin. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, it it says something about that album. No, I, I love that album. Too. Very, It's like really, actually like spe speaks to me personally back in the 90s when I was in high school, getting yeah. into rock. Yeah. Another album that I re actually really loved, I think it's super underrated, is uh, Gilby Clark. Yeah. Punch Shop Guitar, love another Gilby. guy that you play with. Yes. Um, he was actually the first like kind of rock star that I ever met, nicest guy, and I... So do you agree with his music? Do you think it's underrated? I, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Gilby is a great blues rock guitar player, and he writes unconventionally. You know, he's not just doing the standard stuff. And, and I think 
his vocals, you know, because he, he doesn't tout himself as a singer, mm-hmm. but I think he's the only guy that can sing his music. Right. You know what I mean? If he mm-hmm. got a singer to come and sing his songs, it wouldn't be a Gilby Clark, you know what I mean? So, right, definitely. You know. um, let me know if you need to get going. No, 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 we're good, man. Okay, Let's okay, hang cool, for a little bit. Let's hang. All right. Um, how about uh, CeCe DeVille? That's another guy that you worked with. Um, now, he's so high energy, and back in the day, they were just, they were so much about the drugs and boozing and partying. But I'm sure when you, by the time you worked with him in the 90s, I think he had cleaned up. So how does he channel that energy? Because now he's sober, right? I'm assuming we're mostly yeah. sober. Like he's not doing cocaine and stuff. So is he still pretty like crazy and stuff? You know, I don't, I don't know him. Uh, it's been a long time since I've, I've seen him. I mean, I did yeah. see them at a poison show, you know, a couple years ago. Right. And, uh, you know, just, we just kind of, you know, hey, you know, I don't wow. think you knew who I was. But uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I jammed with him a few times at the cat club. Uh, when and we were doing Samantha set, like he was going to put together Samantha seven and right. we had a bass player myself and him. And he was, I, I think he was on, you know, he was, he was going for it then. Cause he, I mean the, the stories in between the songs were, were just like crazy, but he was awesome. Yeah, you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? But I think he was, uh, I think he was having a good time back then, you know, <laughs> nothing but a good time back then. <laughs> Uh, gotcha. But I think since he's gotten now his, he's kind yeah, of he's had kind to, of, it's like you said together. like you kind of reach that point where you get old enough where you're like you almost like have to kind of clean up a little or at least tone things down a little exactly. bit exactly right? but you know no matter whether he's you know drinking or do, doing whatever he did yeah. he's always going to be CC Deville and there's yeah. only one yeah he's got quite a personality another guy that you work with uh, Janie Lane one of my favorite yeah. uh, singer songwriters of all Me time. Too. Now, uh, I don't know if you, I'm sure you probably know that there's a recent revelation. I actually uh, talked about this on my podcast a few, a couple months ago about there was a rumor that he had been raped by some like uh, other band manager or uh, music and or musician. Yeah. And then now it finally came out. It's kind of, it's basically saying that it's true. Like he said it on a radio interview and, yeah, and I heard ex- that. What, do you have any thoughts of that? Or uh, I mean, because to me, it just. It kind of expl- I don't think it gives an excuse for like how you know he 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 died and he obviously overindulged and he went through all that stuff. But it, to me, it really explains it, and it's like I kind of feel really bad for him now. It's not like he just made bad decisions and was a fuck up or something. Yeah. It's like he he was going through some yeah, really he had tough a lot stuff. Of pain, you know. Yeah. So yeah, if, if that allegation is you know correct, and there's no other reason you know why it wouldn't be, um, because I think it would be a shame if if somebody you know, use that to yeah. sell a book or to come out and try and get some attention, which right. I, but I don't think that's how no, it went down. I don't think people make that shit yeah, up. From, you, you know, know it's, it, it's really bad to do that. It's not good for the karma, you no. know, thing. but, uh, yeah, you know, um, that's some, some deep, dark stuff that, you know, you, you either have to deal with it, but you know, how do you deal with that? Mm-hmm. And I think if you don't have the tools to, you know, deal with it and really process it, then you drink yeah. right? or you do what, right. and, and uh, you know, ending up in a hotel on Woodland Hills at a Comfort Inn and, and, and dying is, uh, man, nobody wishes that on anybody else. And, and it just tells you the level of the pain he was in, you know? Yeah, exactly. So what was he like to work with? I mean, because he, I literally think, I think he's a genius though, yeah, but no, he, he was, was a mess at that point. He was a mess. Yeah. I, I think, you know, we would we would fly out to the East coast and we would get there. And so the three band guys, Dario, uh, my buddy, Chad, who's a Phoenix guy here, plays in bullet boys. Uh, Mm -hmm. Chad actually is the one that got me the audition for Janie back in 06. And, um, I would show up there. And so we'd all be together. We wouldn't see Janie cause he'd be flying in on a different flight. Mm -hmm. So we'd be waiting. And then a bag would come out on the, you know, would just be circling the carousel. And everybody else would be gone except for the three of us and this one bag. And I go, I bet you that's Janie's bag. And sure as not, we go there, check it. You know, so John Oswald on it. And I go, all right. Well, so then we call Abby. Hey, uh, we got Janie's bag, but we don't see Janie. Yeah, he didn't make the plane. He went and checked his bag and left. So we would, we would stay in a hotel that night. They would fly us back, and we always got paid for the shows, whether hmm. we didn't. So, so, so where, you know, he just got too drunk or something? Or? I, you know, I'm not sure what was going on, but yeah. And, and uh. the few shows that we did do, um, yeah, he was in a bad place. He was, oh. uh, and, and I'm not trying to sling mud to, no, to, no, no, to no. make him look bad, but he was in a bad place. And <laughs> I don't think I realized the, ser- you know, you don't sometimes understand like how serious it is. And it also really wasn't my place to have a heart to heart with no, him because no, I didn't know him on yeah, that exactly. level. You know what I mean? Right. So you just kind of like, well, what can I do to make this ha- Like, how can I help this situation so we can get the yeah. shows done? No, you know, cause tough. that's what, cause that's what we're all out here yeah, to do. Right. You know, so you don't want to overstep your boundaries, but you also, you know, you're, you want to like find a way to fix a potential problem because I think that's the right thing to do. You know, you don't sit there and 
just close your eyes to it. No. But you also, do, you know, like this isn't my place to get involved. So, you know, I kind of just sat on the sideline. I was the new guy, you know, yeah, I sat sure. on the sidelines and, uh, and, uh, but that's the only band I ever got fired from. Oh, you actually got fired? I got fired from that band. Yeah. Why? You know, I, I don't know. Um, I, I think I may have overstepped the boundaries one oh, time. Yeah. <laughs> we played a place called the Webster Theater in uh, Hartford, Connecticut, which was a place I played with Dizzy Reed, Alex Grossi, Hookers and Blow numerous times. It's a yeah. legendary heavy metal rock bar. I mean, it's actually not a bar. It's a, it's a, uh, a theater, okay. you know, probably 2000 people. Mm -hmm. And we played there and, and, uh, I was really good friends with the owners and stuff. Cause I did a lot of the business with hookers and blow. So I knew those people, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that was home. We played there all the time. And Janie went in there and he's punching walls and, uh, oh, you shit. know, just, just, he just wasn't having a good time. Sure. And so I said something, I'm like, bro, this is, this is my hood here, man. Don't, you know, I wouldn't go to your house and let my friends knock your walls. Like, come on, man. You know, let's, you know, trying to, trying to make the situation a little bit better. Yeah. And, and, uh, his, his girlfriend, or I don't think they were ever married, Sheila, who I still talk to today. I don't think she liked me very much. Cause I, <laughs> you know, I, 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 sometimes I got a big mouth, but you yeah. know, I, I was like, Hey man, you know, don't come in here and do that. That's right. not cool. Cause you're not going to hear about it. You know, maybe mm -hmm. the management will hear, Hey, Janie's down here, but you know, they're going to come to me going, dude, what's oh. up with your, your singer guy? Tell Janie to not, you know what I mean? Right. So, it, you know, I think I maybe, you know, kind of, you know, talk too loud once and, Oops. you know, so yeah. So, you know, Abby called me, he's like, Hey man, uh, we're not going to need your services anymore. I'm like, Oh wow. I Ouch. think I just got fired from Janie Lane's oh, band, okay. you know, wow. but I was never the guy not showing up for the gigs. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. made the plane ride right wow. every time, but uh, no, I got to tell you the, the, the handful of shows we did back yeah. in 06 uh, were awesome. I mean, I was playing with the yeah. guy, you know? Well, it, that's what uh, Marcus got from Trickster. He said that they, they did the uh, Blood, Sweat and Beers tour. Yeah. And he said that he would, Janie would get hammered, but then somehow he would still magically show up and just play lights out every show. Never, didn't matter how uh, fucked up he was. He would still sing and be crawling off, off the uh, amps and stuff yeah. and jumping off the rafters and and he was crazy. So yeah, he's a beast. Hey, you know our hospitality. We want to thank Anne. By the way, we're here uh, at the Copper Blues, and we're doing yeah. uh, benefit for the Justice Center. Oh yeah, tonight, and uh, it's a rock and roll celebrity show. We got guys from Candlebox. We got Brandon Gibbs. We mentioned yes. myself, uh, Joel Colche from Collective Soul, Collective Soul EJ, yes. you know from uh, Gilby's band, yes. Silent Rage. So that's why we're all here. Anyway, she brought some bevies. Okay. Uh, would you like, can I crack one for you? <laughs> yes, absolutely. What are you going to get? I'll grab one. I will grab, I'll just right. grab a Bud Light. You just grab a Bud Light and I'll do the uh, Jeopardy theme in the meantime. Do, do, do. This is the beer opening thing. I'm going to crack you, a dude. Guinness, but yeah, dude, uh, welcome. You're so nice. All right. Um, let's keep <laughs> talking. So Mike Tramp, uh, you worked, speaking of solo bands, you worked with his solo band and then that led to a gig in White, White Lion, Lion yeah. which is what so, he's, his, he's famous for. Now, my question for that, uh, well, I want to hear about working with him too, sure. but also, um, I know, obviously, Vito Brada, the former guitarist, he sued the band. There was a big feud there. Did there was there, was there ever a resolution with that? Are you guys allowed to use the White Lion name? Is he no, okay or no? You know, um, what happened was, I mean, God, this is a really, really long story, and I'll, I'll uh, not bore the listeners with the um, the legal details of it. But yeah. look up, just Google Gabe Reed and or Gabe Reed Rolling Stone. You'll f see the full article. Uh, Gabe okay. Reed is the one that lost the. White Lion trademark because he was our attorney, but he's not a real attorney. He was using somebody else's. Uh, what? Yeah. Are you serious? A, oh, yeah. Yeah. He's in prison right now. 50 months, I think. So hi, Gabe Holy Reed. Shit. I can't wait to see you in a couple years. But anyway, wow, um, that's crazy. Mike and Vito have since, you know, um, mended the fences. And, you know, Mike. Oh, that's so good to hear. You know, Mike, Mike feels uh, and this part bums me out a little bit, but he kind of feels like he should have never gone out and done another White Lion. Mm -hmm. and, we, and I think that really, because we put out one album, uh, Return of the Pride, in 2008. Mm. And we also uh, put out a couple live albums and a live D DVD. And I get it's not the classic guys. Sure. And, and it wasn't about that. It was, you know, it was about those songs, you know. Mm -hmm. And we did our damnedest to own those songs and to play them properly for people that wanted to come out and see White Lion and hear White Lion music. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when he says he's bummed out that I probably should have never done it, I should have never called the band White Lion, I should have mm -hmm. never put out another album, it sort of takes that experience away from me. Mm -hmm. I won't let it, but it bums me out because it's like, you know, dude, you know, maybe you go, yeah, you know, next time I wouldn't do it that way, but don't have regrets for something you did. Right. You know, because... Because you're part of that. You know, it, yeah, exactly. And, it, and it's not fair to the other guys that, uh, you know, some tours didn't get paid or... 
left their families for eight months out of the year. You know, mm -hmm. don't take that away from because we were there for the end all be all, yeah. whatever that was. We, you know, we, we were soldiers. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, yeah, maybe that wasn't the right thing to do, but, uh, you know, for him mm -hmm. and he looks back on it going, ah, I probably wouldn't have done it that way, but yeah. that's what we did. And that's yeah. how we did it. And don't, you know, own it and, and, and go, this is what it was. And it was, it was great. It wasn't what I intended it to be. It wasn't with Vito, but Vito didn't want to have a part of it, you know? Well, so. I, so he didn't necessarily say that he's like, he'd wish he didn't, didn't make that album then. Did no, he? no. I, I, I think he, or just wish he didn't call it white lion that wish he would call it Mike tramp solo. Sure. Something okay. like that, you know, but, uh, needless to say, you know, that experience and playing with him for so many years <laughs> has allowed me to get into a, a lot of connections and playing with, sure. with other bands and, you know, people that I grew up watching on MTV. I mean, you know, are now peers of mine and, and I appreciate that. I mean, are you still, no, are you still technically in white lion or, or is that there really isn't a white lion? There really is. Yeah, okay. there, so is, there kind of isn't on hiatus. Then. Okay. It's not even on high. It's, it'll, it's just, it'll never happen again. He'll if just you, be Mike tramp solo. Now. Yeah. Okay. You know? And so, you know, we've, we've been talking, he, he's been threatening to, to do a full band tour in the States for the past three or four years. And, uh, as Mike tramp or as Mike tramp. Yeah. yeah you know, okay. and, and he's got the band of brothers that he does over overseas with, uh, okay. some Danes. And he was going to do kind of the Mike Tramp band of brothers over here with some some guys that are stateside. Yeah. And uh, it might happen sometime this year. It was supposed to happen sometime in the spring, but he's just going to come out and do acoustic stuff around the M3 or Monsters of Rock or whatever he's. And then he'll just kind of cruise around for a couple of weeks and then go back over there. So the goal is to get him out here to do a full band thing. He's been doing acoustic tours, which yeah. are awesome storytelling yeah, stuff. Cool. But I think people want to see him rock a little bit. You he's know, still got his voice still good. It's still oh, he's, he's got a great voice. Songs? Yeah, I, he's singing. The weight and stuff. That's a yeah, hard song yeah. to sing. Okay. You know, he's not singing up in that register, you know, anymore. And I don't even think that register for him. He listens to and he cringes. He's like, I don't know. You know, when you're when you're in your you know teens and twenties. You can hit that stuff, mm -hmm. but if you want to have a career 30 years down the road, you're not hitting that stuff anymore. So you got to find a way to kind of reinvent it. But I think, yeah. I think Mike feels that where he's at vocally yeah. is where he should have been the whole time. Okay. So mm -hmm. he's very happy with, with where he's at. He's very yeah. happy with himself as an artist and, and how he's grown and, and, and the albums he's put out. And, and I, I, you know, I, I get chills thinking about how, cause he was miserable out there doing white line, mm. you know, it just, it was never enough and never right. Even though we played, you know, in front of 43,000 people in, in, hmm. in India and it was awesome. I, I think he always felt something was missing or lacking. And now I feel like he's at home. He's very happy with himself oh. and he's he'll still do yeah. white line songs. Oh yeah. Okay. He just does them in a little bit of a different way. He does them in the Mike oh, tramp okay. way, you know, oh. and his solo stuff, very singer songwriting, you know, Dylan, uh, Brian Adams, that kind oh, of stuff. Interesting. Oh yeah. Okay. Springsteen. Very cool. You know? Yeah. So tell me about the lost angels. This is a band with you. Uh, Eric Dover, who was the singer of Slash the Snake Pit yeah. and played with Alice Cooper. Uh, John Karabi, who we've already talked about, was in Motley Crue. Um, EJ uh, Kurse, who's playing tonight, I think, right? And he's yeah. Gilby's yeah. band. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Eric Brittingham uh, from Cinderella was in one of the incarnations of okay, it. Okay, incarnation. Uh, Muddy Stardust, um, who played in Burning Tree. Okay, Mark Ford from uh, Black Crows. Oh. This is before yeah. Black Crows. So, okay, right. So, yeah. um, so uh, Muddy had played in, uh, he was in L.A. Guns. He was in Chris Robinson's uh, solo, solo brother, yeah, Brotherhood. Yeah. So Muddy was in the first incarnation when we went to India with uh, Eric Dover, John Karabi, myself, and Muddy. And, uh, you know, we've got Ryan Roxy that does our European stuff, who's mm -hmm. in Alice Cooper. So, yeah, it, you know, it just started off as a, a band. I got called to put together a gig. Hi, Ann, thanks for the beer. To do Thank a, you for the beer. <laughs> to do a gig out in India and to put together an all-star thing. So we... Uh, Lost Angels came about in 2001 when I was asked by a promoter who, um, 2000, yeah, t no, 2010, I'm sorry. 2001 okay. was when I first started playing with Mike Tramp solo. Anyway, yeah. so 2008, White Lion plays India. 2009, I get asked by a promoter, hey, can you put together a band? We talked about Gilby, some other guys, and Gilby was unavailable to do it. So then I called John Karabi, who was a roommate of mine. And Eric Dover, who I knew, and Muddy, I had been in a band with. So, hey, do you guys want to go to India? We'll put a band together. The band was originally called Los Angels, The Angels. Oh, okay. And Muddy's mom goes, no, you should call yourself The Lost Angels. I go, you know what? She's probably on to something. So hmm. that's how that name came cool about. Name, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, we, we, you know, we've played India. We've played Australia. We've been to Mexico. We've been to Scandinavia, Europe, uh, you know, France, Belgium, wow. the U.K., uh, Ireland, and you know, it's just one of those bands that when everybody can get together outside of their, you know, daily gigs mm -hmm. and stuff, 
we put it together and we go somewhere and have fun for a couple weeks. And yeah, it's uh, kind of like a super group, basically. You know, um, you know, I call it a superb group, is what it is. And, and uh, you <laughs> I know, like a super that. group. And I've already yeah. used a super group. So wait, group, who sings? And does John sing or Eric? John, or they both they, they trade both off? sing. So oh, we do. Cool. Yeah, so we do John Karabi solo material. We do Hooligans Holiday. Oh, Eric Dover. Oh, we do awesome. Slash. We do Jellyfish. We do yeah. Imperial Drag. And when Roxy's in a band, we do uh, Alice Roxy Cooper solo. Song. We do a lot of Alice Cooper. Plus Ryan and uh, Eric were in Alice Cooper together for oh. almost a decade. So we do a lot of, you know, they, they did the Eyes of Alice Cooper album together. So oh, we okay. do a track off of that. Nice. And um, and then we do some White Lion tunes and we do some stuff we dig. We, you know, we yeah. do The Sweet, we do Queen, you know, whatever. Just mm -hmm. some stuff that, and we are currently tracking vis-a-vis uh, -vis the internet an EP right now. Oh, nice. Yeah, well, so we're actually cool. going to put out, this might be where we jump the shark at this, you know, but we're actually going to put out some original material. So Eric awesome. Brittingham, Eric Brittingham's going to have uh, some bass guitars. Oh, EJ, cool. uh, we're going to have a Karabi track on there. We're going to have a Ryan Roxy and we're going to have Eric Dover. Awesome. That's going to be, oh, can't wait to hear that. And then, um, Cheap Thrill, that's the bit. You're also in that band with Brandon. Is that technically what it's built tonight? Is it Cheap Thrill? Cheap Thrill, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, so originally uh, Brandon and Joel were going to come here and do an acoustic thing. And then, um, we, uh, well, I think then Anne, who d was gracious enough to bring us some beers, yes, thank you, had Anne. decided to, um, you know, hey, can we bring Troy out and add a cajon, you know? Let's, so, yeah, because uh, we had been doing some acoustic shows that, you know, the way these guys are checking right now. Okay. And then um, we were out here for a Gilby show at a venue that had closed its doors. I was going to go to that show, BLK yeah. okay Live. BLK yeah, okay Live. I, I was going to go to that show, and then all of a sudden I see a tweet from Gilby saying, hey guys, uh, the show is not going on because the venue has closed. They yeah. didn't tell him. He yeah. had to fly out here. And we flew out here. So you were there for that. Oh. I was here for Dude, that. I so, so we were, for you guys. So we were at the, 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 uh, the hotel waiting, and you know we can tell that we were getting the runaround a little bit from the, the staff, just not really sure what was going on. Yeah. And we found out that it, it wasn't happening. So... Uh, Anne, who is our host tonight, was gracious enough to kind of take us out and go, you know, sorry this happened. I know a lot of the people because she's in, you know, she's yeah. got her business out here. And um, she took us, you know, we went and saw a band. We went to a club and, you know, just had some food and hung Where'd out. Where'd you go? Which club? Do you remember? Uh, we, you know, I, I don't remember where the band was and I can't remember the name that of sucks. the... sucks. I would have come and hung out, hung out with you guys. We ended up hanging... I mean, we, that, <laughs> that's the only way to salvage the night. It was yeah. a Friday night in Phoenix. They should have thrown you up on one of the other, like, Wasted Grain or one of these other yeah, rock it clubs. Just, it was just so sucks. late to make something happen. So um, fucked up. But uh, anyway, so that was when Ann met... EJ and found hmm. out that we were doing some cheap throw stuff as hmm. a as a sort of strip we can also do it as a stripped down full band thing. Okay. So that's how two became three became four and that's uh, why we're here tonight. You know, obviously awesome. for a good cause for the veterans too. But um yeah, I, I will I just want to add this that the the owners of BLK Live did pay us in full. Wow. Okay, yeah. that's very cool. Because yeah, I wondered that about that. That doesn't happen. Yeah. That doesn't happen. Yeah. Because so. what they just they got kind of fucked over, right? Yeah. Or, well, the, the, the whoever happened? owns the building oh. put a lock on it, so oh. they 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 could not even get in, and they had their own okay. gear in there and stuff too. They had oh, a sound coming. Shit. So everybody got kind of screwed wow. in the deal. I think the city of Scottsdale was out upset with the outside stuff, oh. and what had, what happened? What had happened was uh, they. <laughs> They were just putting screws on the owner, and he yeah. just got sick of having to deal with it. But uh, the owners of BLK Live did pay us in full, and and um, you know, sorry to see it go. It was a nice venue. Yeah, that sucks. So, um, of all the cra of all the bands that you've toured with, what's the craziest thing that's happened? I mean, because you toured with Enough's Enough. Pretty Boy Floyd, all these other things that we've mentioned. Pretty Boy Floyd. Christy Majors chased me down in a hotel and tried to beat me up in Stockholm. <laughs> that was my last show with, with, uh, what? with Pretty Boy Floyd. No, I, was, I did I was, not hear this story. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, he was mad because he thought I got my own hotel room and I was trying to, you know, cheat him out of the room when actually I was looking for them to swap rooms with them. Yeah. And he, you know, they were... It, I love Christy, but, you know, when he gets... When he's in a mode and he thinks that that's what's happening... Then he just, he's full force. And it's like, this isn't the story, man. This is not yeah. what's it. So he chased me down. Thank God Chris, the bass player, tackled him and, and stopped him from beating me up. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, because yeah. I was interested about that because Pretty Boy Floyd, I mean, I didn't think they were, like, I mean, they, I like them. I'm a fan, but I didn't know they were, they were it sounds like you guys toured the world with that. Are they bigger overseas? And oh, stuff? yeah. Yeah. No, when, oh, I, when I joined okay. the band, I actually took over the booking because I was working at Chris's agency, yeah. Artists Worldwide. Who books a lot of these bands we're talking about? Enough's Enough, yeah, Bang Tango, yeah. Gilby Clark, and, you know, at White Lion at the time. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, yeah, we went to uh, Australia, South America, Europe, wow. Stockholm, you know, um, 
Scandinavia, you know, we, we played everywhere. Hmm. Uh, the band was very, very busy when I was in it because that was my sole job was to book the band. Yeah, I think that's the, right. Yeah. I think that's sub- the thing that separates them from everybody else is that uh, they are the quintessential... 80s glam rock band definitely definitely so they own that title it's not a huge title but they're at the top of the heap yeah so when you want that those are the guys you get sure yeah and i i heard a rumor that uh they they uh, did a show with ugly kid joe and that's how ugly kid joe's name came about they kind of did it as a joke like oh you're pretty boy floyd we'll be ugly kid joe and then that name just stuck i don't know if that's true but it's a great story yeah it's a great story but you mentioned that um you booked those shows for so you have a booking agency where you do you still have that and you were no no no, i was i was actually uh, working for chris's agency Mm -hmm. as as an agent you know learning the ropes uh for about three years um but you know he was like well why don't you just book floyd hmm and get that going. Okay. And uh, so that's kind of where I learned the booking ropes. And I still book, you know, we played last night in Vegas and I have a relationship with with people all over, oh. you know, touring for 20 years in the States. You make friends and, you know, if you're the guy sort of, you know, dealing with uh, all the details, right. you make those friends and you have a good night and you go, hey, who do I contact? I'm like, hey, man, call me. Yeah. And so whenever I put something together, I can call and go, hey, it's Troy from such and such. Mm-hmm. We got this going on. Are you interested? And, uh, you know, you make those relationships and you work out a deal and come out and play for some people, you know. Yeah, but uh, that's very cool. Yeah, you know, I, I, I tour managed just out of necessity in White Lion, well, with Mike Tramp in 2001, mm-hmm. because we would be driving, we'd get to the club at noon, nobody would be there, nobody knew where the hotel was, nobody knew where to go. This is the day before, you know, the age before the, the cell phones and having, you mm-hmm. know, internet and so I got my cell phone and I'm Googling addresses, which was very difficult back in 01. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I was like, well, who handles this? Why are we showing up at the club four hours early and then waiting f- to find out the hotel where we should go straight to the hotel? Right. So he handed me all the stuff. He goes, take care of it. And <laughs> I, I didn't know what to do, but that's yeah. where I learned. You figured it out. How to do it. That's very cool. And then, I, you know, I've, I've since tour managed uh, the band Fuel. Fuel, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah Brett that. Skines and Fuel. And uh, and then I uh, tour managed Bobby Blotzer's Rat. Oh, yeah. And that was always fun. That's cool. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That didn't, uh, the story of Don Doc and uh, threatening that that uh, Bobby was gonna feel two hits. Wait, him what? hitting him and Bobby hitting the floor. Yeah, that's what a true story. There? Oh, they just got in a, a bitch fight at a at a bar at a hotel after a gig <laughs> because Don played five minutes too long and this is the fucking rat show and you're not oh. gonna just respect me and you know so Jeez. they're you know and Don Don comes walking out in his trench coat straight to the bar and he literally t- I'm standing between I'm like Don come on dude what. It's Blotzer. Yeah, Don't yeah. worry about it, dude. Have have a drink. It's all good. And uh, he goes, Bob, there's going to be two hits. Me hitting you and you hitting the floor. And I'm like, Don, <laughs> did you really just say that? It was unbelievable. Yeah, so oh, that's great funny. stories from those guys. You man. got some I, good stories. Dude, man. you just sit back and watch. Yeah. Let them no, go, that's man. That's great. That's awesome. Um, do you still have your t-shirt business, too? You know, no, t-shirt no, business no. Yeah, dead clubs. Yeah, no. You, uh, you, it was like old clubs like the Starwood where you made yeah. t-shirts. That's so, kind of a cool idea. Uh, yeah, my, my partner, Kenny, um, bought the licenses for, you know, <laughs> Gazaris and okay. uh, all, all the different clubs all over. Mm. And uh, so, no, that business is no longer uh, around. But I, I do believe he still owns the licenses. But mm. I thought it would have been a great business because, yeah. you know, those places are still around. You know, Gazari's uh, not still around, but, you know, the, the legacy is the still legacy, around. The legacy, yeah. The Cat and House is another one. I think Ricky Rockman, has yeah. he sells those Cat House t-shirts. I, think I never got to go there. I yeah. Young, no, I, I never went either. I wasn't there. It was been closed cool. before I got out. Yeah. yeah. Um, you said you enjoy the business side as much as the musical side. You also had a, a radio show, This, That, and the Other. Is that? I still, still do that. that. You still do that? Okay, Yeah, cool. you know, uh, I, actually, I'm going to probably take your board because it's much nicer <laughs> than mine. But uh, These are great. Seriously, get one for yeah, sure. Yeah, I had a weekly show, and I'm no longer broadcasting on that station, so okay. now I'm just kind of doing I'm I'm working on something for this year where I'm going to take that show to another station where I can go and do this on a weekly basis. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've had uh, Malcolm Jamal Warner on my show. I've had from, Brett. From the Cosby Show? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Brett Scallions from Fuel. Gilby's been on the show. I've had... Uh, Susan Olsen, Cindy Brady. <laughs> That's you know, great. Uh, Mark Rippon. Oh, you know? yeah, he's a coach. Yeah, MVP. So, um, you know, so people like that. That's very you know? cool. So I'm how looking to do... How do you get the guests? How do you just randomly, or do you know these people? I, I, I know them or how do have you know connections. Mark uh, a friend of a friend 
knew his assistant or whatever oh. and said, hey, I can get, would you be interested? I'm like, yeah, he's a Super Bowl MVP. Of course. Let's right, get it, you yeah. know. And I think Mark was tipping back a couple of cocktails and having a good time. We had a great conversation. Oh, yeah. That's cool. And that's I'm going to archive exciting. all that stuff at some point for people to go back and listen to because I have had some really great conversations in the past. Yeah. Brandon Gibbs has been on the show. Oh, awesome. He's been on my show too. Yeah, yeah right on. We got something in common. <laughs> something in common. Uh, so you've done a lot of great stuff. Do you ever have any, it seems like you're so busy doing all this stuff. Do you ever have any it's downtime? All the what do you do for fun? Fun. Play softball on Sundays. Really? Yeah, I'll be hightailing out of here at 10 a.m. so I can get to my softball league tomorrow. Okay, that sounds fun. Do yeah, you like softball? To, you like, bowl. My, you my pitch girl or and I you, bowl. What position do you play? No, um, I uh, I play in the outfield Ooh. and sometimes infield when they're desperate. Okay, I'm not great at the infield, but okay. I can catch a mean ball and I got wheels, man. Right, I'm almost awesome. 50 and I can still run fast. Well, thank you. Um, uh, we probably should wrap up. It seems like everyone's getting Yeah, yeah. There. Yeah, I, we got to go to the hotel. Way over and, the 20 minutes. I really appreciate I gotta it. I got to go to the hotel and wash off the failure. Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> the failure? What? Yeah, it's going to be a long shower. Oh, just it's just a saying. Oh, okay. Never yeah, heard don't worry about before. it. Um, I always like to end on a charity. Did you have a, do you want to talk about the charity that we're promoting tonight? Or? Well, Justice Center, uh, charity for veterans, and it's a, gr- it's a great charity. It's a great cause. I don't know tons about it, but by the, by the end of the night, I'm definitely going to learn about it. And yeah. then, um, you know, other other charities and, and things that uh, that I'm into are anything to do with animal rescue, you know. So, awesome. we, so we, you know, we're probably going to have 20 dogs in the next year. <laughs> we're going to save all the dogs, yeah. all the old. We're going to get the old ones that, uh, you know, nobody wants. God, I, well, we're I feel bad them. about the Australia. Have you been following oh, that at dude, all? Yeah, like, it, that you know, breaks my heart. Not to close a blind eye, but I can't I can't watch it. You know, yeah, the tough. people, it's not even the people of all, you know, it's. I, for some reason, when I hear about the animals, that affects me more than, because I feel yes. like the people have a fighting chance. Yes. Like, you have the a animals choice. don't. No, you're right. And yeah. that sucks. And then to hear so. that, you know, 200 people have been accused Whoa. of starting those fires. And, really? I didn't uh, know. Yeah. I didn't yeah. That. And about 30, this is as of a few days ago, 30 people had been uh, arrested for it. So this is not, uh, you know, a, a global warming thing. This right. is people, t- arson Being in assholes. some cases. So, yeah. you know, how dare you? <laughs> Terrible, terrible. Well, is there anything else that you have on the horizon that you want to promote? Uh, any music coming out? I mean, you said the Lost Angels has an EP. That might be- yeah, we're working on an EP. Okay. Uh, we're working on the Lost Angels. Uh, we're calling it the Hindsight 2020 Tour in mm-hmm. March. We're going to be in Italy and uh, Scandinavia. Okay. Uh, we've just announced two dates, March 20 and 21. Uh, we'll be on Rock the Boat on the 20th and then uh, High Voltage in Copenhagen on the 21st. And, uh, you know, Gilby Clark's got a new album coming out. Oh, he does? Pretty soon, yeah. Oh, I think I they're wait. releasing a single soon. Uh, EJ cool. and myself tracked a, a few tunes on there. Okay. And then uh, I think that's about it in a bubble bath with Brandon Gibbs later. That's all I got on the horizon. <laughs> Making sure he's listening. Oh, yeah. yeah, just, you know. So sure. is, is Gilby, are you guys going to come maybe maybe come back to Arizona and do a show? We, we Hopefully need to come back here. We got, business. we got Jip last time, yeah, so we'll, we'll come back and so make it I. up. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, thanks so much for being on the show. Yeah, Appreciate cheers, it. bro, man. Thanks. Right. I can be found on all the usual suspects. Yes, you're social on all the media. social yeah, media, Twitter, tr- tr- Instagram, Yeah, yeah, just look up Facebook, uh, Drummer Troy YouTube. or Troy Patrick Farrell. And you have your website, drummertroy.com. Drummertroy.com, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank cool, you so man. much. Thanks, right, bro. Cool. Well, there you have it, Troy Patrick Farrell. Uh, that was a really fun interview for me. Uh, being in the green room at Cover Blues Live is always a fun place to record. feels like you're kind of in the action with a rock band, and Brandon Gibbs is there, who I've interviewed before, and... And it was just a really fun show that night as well. So I hope you guys enjoyed the interview. Uh, a lot of good stories. It'll be fun to follow uh, Troy's career with Cheap Thrill, Lost Angels, and whatever else he has up his sleeve next. So um, I've got some great interviews lined up. So I hope you guys uh, enjoy the past interviews and, and future interviews that I'll have as well. Until next time, uh, see you then.